Welcome to the Chicago Bar Association's Justice and Law Weekly. I'm Dan Coton, President of the CBA. Chicago has been in the national headlines because of record levels of violent crime. In 2016, Chicago reported 762 homicides. That's a 60% increase from the preceding year. What can be done to reverse this alarming trend? A 28-year veteran of the force and a Chicago native, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson joins us today to discuss his plans regarding this violence epidemic. And I thank you so much for being with us here today, Superintendent. Thank you for having me. We have a lot to talk about. There are all sorts of hot button issues. But let's take a moment first and talk a little bit about you. <laughs> I understand that you were born in the Cabrini Green projects, but then soon thereafter moved to the south side with your family. Is that right? Yeah, I lived in Cabrini Green until I was about roughly nine years old. And uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, shortly thereafter, we, we left uh, the public housing complex. But what I can tell you is this there were a lot of good people back then. Uh, you know, the community stuck together, but of course it has it had its challenges. And then we moved over to the uh, far south side by Morgan Park. Uh, and that's where you still live? Yeah. Now, um, I also read that you've got a bachelor's degree from Governor State University. Mm -hmm. And this kind of surprised me. You're currently in a master's of public policy program at Northwestern, is that right? <laughs> yes. Planning to get your master's degree this year? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, it would be completed already had I not gotten promoted. But you know, um, life and CPD kind of got in the way of it. You know, but I still plan on finishing up. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, now, the Laquan McDonald video surfaced uh, a year ago in January, mm -hmm. and there's no need to rehash that case. But suffice it to say that the reaction and the response to that video has had far-reaching implications upon law enforcement, our legal system, and the community at large. And with that as a backdrop, suddenly, last April, you're appointed superintendent of Chicago Police. <laughs> Not exactly a smooth transition to your new position, is it, sir? Yeah, it was, it was a little challenging, a little rocky, because, you know, with the release of the Laquan McDonald video, you know, of course, it caused a lot of upheaval in the city and within CPD. You know, we changed leadership. Uh, and a actually at that time, the state laws changed in terms of how law enforcement documented their contacts with uh, citizens every day. So a lot of things happened at one time that uh, kind of put us back on our heels a little bit. But, and it took a while to recover from that, but I think we've recovered nicely. So there have been three events in recent weeks which I think continue this concerning trend that we're facing. Uh, one of them is the report of 762 homicides, a 60% increase from 2015. Uh, the second thing was the, uh, the scathing report that came out from the Department of Justice regarding the Chicago Police Department. And then uh, the repeated recent comments and tweets from President Trump regarding the Chicago violence and the situation that we're dealing with here. Um, now, I may be oversimplifying things, and I'm sure you'll, you'll point it out if, if I am. But from my perspective, it, it seems that many of these issues can be discussed really under, under two separate umbrellas. Uh, number one, the relationship between the police department and the community. Mm -hmm. And number two, <coughs> um, guns, for lack of a better term, the gun problem. Right. Um, so if it's okay with you, sir, let's, let's take those as separate, as separate categories and let's sure. talk about some things. Um, community relations. The Chicago police officers on the streets put their lives on the line every day to protect us. We all know that. But in recent years, and, and, and most particularly since the McDonald video was released, there seems to be a lack of respect for police and maybe more concerning, a lack of trust of police within the community. Can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, you know, listen, I've been out here for 28 years, and I can tell you that I've never seen the disrespect towards law enforcement that we see out here in the streets today. And, and that's not just Chicago, it's a national epidemic, and we have just absolutely have to change that narrative. But I will say this, I have acknowledged before, uh, and I believe that acknowledging issues or problems is the first step to fixing it. And I will say that we did treat uh, African-American and Latino communities um, inappropriately before. 
But what I say to, to the officers now is we're, we are not going to let our sins of the past define who we are now. Uh, it's, it's so very important now that we repair that relationship because believe it or not, like I told you, I lived at Cabrini Green and the people over there actually did trust the police. Now, did we have bad police officers? Yeah, but the community as a whole trusted the police. What's happened now is because we've seen so many questionable incidents on video it makes people wonder, hey, are they doing what they should be doing? When I go into communities now, in the, in the uh, minority communities, most notably the African-American communities, what they want, they don't want the police to leave, they just want the police to treat them fairly, respectfully, and professionally. And to that end, you know, since I became superintendent myself and other members of the command staff, along with the rank and file, we've gotten out there to let the community know we want to be partners with the community and not an occupying force of the community. You mentioned a moment ago that, that Chicago police treated the African American and the Latino community poorly. Is that a reference to the, the, the Officer Burge scandals from the past and, and, and incidents like that? Yeah, all of those things, you know. you you you. Let me say this, the majority of the officers out here today do the job correctly and want to be professional, but you just simply can't have things of that nature occur because when it does, it paints the entire department in a negative light, and that's just not the case, and that's a hard hurdle for us to overcome. So we have to get out there and sh let people know that we are professional and we will treat them respectfully, but it, it does bother uh, it's, it's, it's bad for the community and it's also bad for the rank and file because the majority of officers are good police officers that, tr that are trying to do the right thing. Being the police is not easy. That, it's not an easy job at all. You know, so those types of things most police officers frown upon because it makes us all look bad. You, you mentioned that uh, here in Chicago and also nationally, a trend of uh, a community not respecting police officers. Mm -hmm. Is there a distinction that, that you yourself can perceive from your early days as, a, as, a, as an officer back in 1988 versus your days now as superintendent? Do you see a difference in the respect that's shown? Yeah, I do, I do. Uh, the, the younger folks out there now just have a blatant disrespect for what law enforcement does. And I think that because of the national narrative, They've seen that as an opportunity to seize it and, and continue to do things that they shouldn't do. You know, but in Chicago, you know, we, we have our violence challenges, obviously. You know, but um, there are a lot of good people out there in the community that support the police, but those voices are uh, low when it comes to the anti-police rhetoric. Those voices are loud and they get a lot of attention. Now, as we know, um, from Laquan McDonald's video as well as other videos that are out there, it seems that the, the new digital age that we're living in has really changed everything in terms of relations between police and, and communities. Um, on that note, trying to turn that into a positive, right. I understand that by the end of this year, all Chicago police officers will be wearing body cameras. Is that right? Right. What do you think that'll do in terms of improving the relationships between the community and the police officers? So I think it does a couple of things. First of all, it ensures that we're acting professional the way we're supposed to be because we know we're being video recorded all the time. But at the same time, we notify the citizens that we come into contact with that they're being video recorded and audio recorded also. And believe it or not, that changes their behavior also. So I think that it's important because those body-worn cameras uh, let us tell our, our perspective of it and our side of the story, you know. And, you know, let's face it, uh, technology, when it improves, we should use it and embrace it for a positive. So I think that the fact that a lot of police departments are going to body worn cameras now are a good thing. This is a, probably a related topic. Um, and again, and I, I don't want to keep rehashing the Laquan McDonald video, but it seemed that that was sort of a tipping point in our, in our city's relationship with, with the police. Um, I recently had an opportunity to visit Bond Court at 26th Street, and I was surprised to learn that the number of Bond Court hearings are down by almost half since January of 2016. And when I learned that, I also learned that that's because the arrests are down by almost half in that time period. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And if so, why is that? Yeah, our arrests are down, but this is what I can tell you. 
the notion that the police department is, is back on their heels and not doing their job is just factually incorrect. Our overall arrests are down, but what is up is our gun arrest. Our gun arrest in 2016, as difficult of a year that was, our, gun, our overall gun arrests were up over 9% over 2015. Taking a bad guy off the street with a gun is the most dangerous thing a police officer can do on a day-to-day -day basis, yet we were 9% over in 2016 than we were in 2015. And this year, we're double where we were. So the officers are out there doing their job. You know, the, the, where we lose uh, traction with this whole thing is holding these gun offenders accountable for their actions. Okay, and we can talk more about that. And I think that you've just led us into a perfect transition to start to talk about this gun issue, okay? I know the focus of our conversation needs to be upon the people that are using guns and not necessarily just the guns themselves. But first, let me ask you this. There are simply too many guns in Chicago, both Correct. legal and illegal. Is there anything that we can do about that? Well, you know, I've talked to our federal partners, ATF, uh, uh, in particular about trying to stem this illegal flow of guns. Well, unfortunately, we sit on Lake Michigan and we're a transportation hub. So we, we border the states of Indiana and Wisconsin who have very lax gun laws. So it's easy for people from Chicago to go across the border and get these guns and bring them into the city. What we have in Chicago is, is simply, we have the supply, we have the demand, and most notably, we have the people that are willing to pick them up and use them. And that's a, just a deadly combination, along with the fact that when we do arrest these people, CPD is doing a monumental do job in arresting these, these individuals. But when we arrest them, there is just really no deterrent for them. Our judicial system just doesn't hold them accountable. You recently uh, said um, publicly that, that these people that are using guns have absolutely no respect for our criminal justice they don't. system. That's right. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, I still, believe it or not, I've been out here 28 years and I still get out on the street. I will have gang members tell me Cook County's judicial system to them is a joke. They just don't fear it. You know, um, anytime a person that, that pre-trial is in jail for retail theft, for stealing a loaf of bread, anytime on average that person does more time pre-trial in jail than a gun offender, there's something wrong with the system. These guys, you know, it's no secret to us that when a, um, a shooter for a gang uh, gets arrested, the gang will pool their resources together and bond this guy out. You know, it's just unconscionable to me that we don't do a better job. Everybody, CPD, the judiciary, our legislators, all of us can, can improve in terms of holding these guys accountable. But they have said to me that they think it's a joke. Um, it's an interesting uh, topic that you bring up as it relates to bond court because that has been an, an active uh, conversation amongst many people lately. And that is that um, we hear stories about nonviolent offenders who are stuck in jail for weeks because they can't post $150 to make bond. Um, but on the other hand, we hear about the higher ups in the Chicago gangs who may be on a high bond in Cook County Jail because of gun offenses, and there's no problem at all for them to post the thousands of dollars needed to get back on the streets and continue doing whatever they were doing. Is that the problem that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, let's face it. If you're the head of an organization and one of your best people that you rely on to get things done gets arrested, wouldn't you put your money together to get that guy out? The answer is yes. And, and people uh, have a misunderstanding of, of the criminal element. They're not dummies, you know, they, they do, and they are very efficient at the way that they do things around here. So, you know, the fact that when we look at our judicial system, your first conviction uh, for a gun, illegal gun in Chicago, you may get six months uh, jail time. Your second conviction, you might get a little bit around 16 months. Your third, fourth, fifth, sixth conviction, you might get a little bit over two years. That's ridiculous. You know, if you pick up a gun and you shoot somebody in this city, you should go to prison. I don't care what you rap like. You know, I know that there is the fear of disproportionate incarceration or, or mass incarceration of minorities, but the simple fact is, if you choose to pick up a gun and you use it, then you should go to prison. It doesn't matter what you look like. Do you think that we need changes in our bond court system 
which makes it impossible for gun offenders to be released on bond, no matter how high the set bond is. You know, uh, I had a, a very candid conversation with Sheriff Dart, and he wanted to change the bond system. And his whole idea behind it is the, what you just mentioned a little while ago. The nonviolent offenders give them a, a no bond, and the violent folks keep them in there. And I happen to agree with that. I think that the violent offenders, our violence problem in Chicago is a gun problem period. That's what it is. The fact that we arrest these guys two and three and four times, you know, we're trying to create a system, a culture of accountability so that they won't want to pick up a handgun and use it. That's what we're aiming towards. So, yeah, I think that the violent offender should uh, stay in prison. Or stay in jail or at least jail. until it's time for, yep. for whatever trial that they may be facing for whatever the gun offense might be. Yep, I do. Um, there's comments that are made about um, repeat gun offenders being held without bond. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that makes sense to a certain degree, but it also makes me wonder, what about the guy that uses the gun the first time? That's no less serious than somebody who's been using it multiple times. That's true. I, I, you won't get an argument from me. Uh, the reason why we focus on, focusing on the, the repeat gun offenders is that because they are repeat, they've shown us time and time again you know, that they just don't want to play by the rules of society. You know, that first time guy, listen, I, I am sympathetic to folks that are carrying uh, illegal firearms for protection because they're afraid. I, I get all that. But once you dive into that repeat uh, bucket, then I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it just was happenstance. I think you, you're consciously making a decision to use a weapon. Okay. Um, Chicago is a big city. But there's other big cities in the country, and I'm sure you've been in communication with the, the chiefs of police in those cities as well. Um, are there other cities that have models that may be working better than ours right now that we could follow? Yeah, you know, you look at Chicago, listen, our per capita crime rate is somewhere in the middle of the pack, even though we get a lot of attention nationally, but that's because we're one of the big three cities in, in the country, Chicago, New York, and L.A. You look at New York and L.A., their murder rate is, is half of what ours is. And you have to ask yourself, why? Well, okay, we know that economic support for these impoverished neighborhoods is very important. We know that. But we need things now. So what do they have that we don't? New York, if you, the first time you get caught with an illegal weapon in New York, if you try and convict it, you do three and a half years in prison, period. It doesn't matter what excuse you have, you go to prison for three and a half years. In L.A., they have what's called gun enhancement. So you use a gun while you're committing a crime, 10 extra years. You, you fire that weapon, 15 extra years. You kill somebody, 20 years. So they sent a mental message that don't pick up a gun. And they're seeing the results of that. We don't have that here. Here, you pick up a gun five times and you use it. You might get two years in prison. I don't think that's the message that we want to send to people. The message we want to send is don't pick the weapon up. Okay. So, Superintendent, you've got some initiatives that are actually underway and some that you've been talking about. Let's, uh, let's touch on a, on a couple of those in the, in the few minutes that we have remaining here. Um, you intend to expand our Chicago police force by 1,000 officers. Is that right? Right. What percentage increase is that? Uh, I'm not sure that the exact percentage, but I'll, I'll tell you this, I'll give you raw numbers. So right now we have roughly 12,500 sworn officers. Okay. We want to bump it up to 13,500 by the end of 2018. And that'll put how many more officers on the street at any given time? Well, that'll give us a total of about 900 or so out there. But, uh, you know, we'll put them in strategic locations and, and the, in the places where we see the most crime. Now, on that topic, um, you can probably identify certain police districts, I imagine, which are more prone to violent crime than others. But the papers have been talking about uh, how the, the violence seems to be spreading to all neighborhoods now and that nobody is safe and that we have shootings on North Lakeshore Drive and at Union Station and at places where people wouldn't expect that. Um, from your experience, is most of the gun violence still contained to these certain neighborhoods? Yeah, most of the gun violence is contained on the south and, and west sides. We, we have every now and then a shooting that might take place like on Lakeshore Drive. And, and those are high profile incidents. Last year we, only, we had nine of those incidents in 12 months. So that's not a whole lot. But when we do have them, people take notice of it. But the south and west sides are seeing the bulk 
of our uh, violent crime. And, and to that end, two of our most violent districts, we put some initiatives in place uh, a couple of months ago and we are seeing very good positive results in the Inglewood area and the Harrison districts. Uh, they have uh, drastically cut their shooting incidents down in the month of February and for the year, as a matter of fact. So if we can keep building on that and expand that out, I think we'll see a lot of good pro success and progress in the city during the coming months. Good. Three more initiatives that you've mentioned, um, which maybe you could just touch on briefly, because I frankly don't know what they are, and I imagine our viewers don't either. Strategic support centers, mm -hmm. spot shot spotters, right. and pod cameras. Okay. What are those? Right. So the pod cameras are those cameras that you all see up on the poles with the uh, Chicago Police logo on them, okay. and they, you know, they monitor what's going on in a particular block. Shot spotter is new technology that we that we use that will actually identify when gunshots are fired. And what shot spotter does for us that we didn't have before, we had to rely on a 911 call unless the officer was somewhere close in the area and heard the shots. What shot spotter does is alert us in enough time to when we can actually get there, we'll still see smoke from the, the gunshot. Uh, it, it enhances our response time by about five to seven minutes prior to that 911 call. So that gives us the advantage of apprehending the offenders a lot quicker. The strategic the support uh, centers that we put in the 7th and 11th districts and we're going to expand that out. That's a miniature like uh, fusion center. So those district commanders now have analysts uh, and I want to thank the University of Chicago, the crime lab, for partnering with us uh, in this development. But they'll have uh, civilian analysts, uh, sworn police officers, and that district command will have the ability to get all these notifications and alerts real time. And we also have a uh, software program in there, Hunch Lab, which will help those commanders deploy their officers to be proactive before we have these violent incidents. And that's why those two districts are seeing a lot of uh, progress right now. Great. One last topic. Um, President Trump has been <laughs> tweeting away about Chicago and even recently suggested that if things don't change, he'll send in the feds. What do you think about that? Well, I'm not sure what sending in the feds means, but if it means sending in uh, more FBI, DEA, ATF agents, uh, more funding for some of these mentorship programs and uh, community partnership programs, then we're all for that. You know, um, look, Chicago's a big city, a huge city, and we can use help. You know, we've uh, made requests and we're, we're waiting for that. I mean, at the end of the day, at some point, you have to stop talking about things and you have to do something about it. Superintendent, thank you so much for taking time today to come in here and talk to us. We appreciate you being here. So I really appreciate thank all you of your time me. and your service. And thank you for watching Justice and Law Weekly. <laughs>